Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Yeah from um, Scroll, um, a ZK EVM roll-up on top of Ethereum. Introducing the next generation of DYDX and the next version of the DYDX token. Welcome to the DYDX chain. New token mechanics mean you can stake to secure the network. Staking is fully decentralized and controlled by DYDX token holders. All fees are distributed to stakers. Earn rewards from using the DYDX protocol, with rewards planned for traders and early adopters too. New governance means you are in control. Trading has been democratized. You can vote on protocol improvements, token distributions, and more. Bridge your DYDX to seamlessly transition to DYDX chain. Bridge now at bridge.dydx.trade and contribute to the evolution of DYDX chain, open source and community driven. Run your own validator. Validating is fully permissionless. Join us on our mission to democratize access to financial opportunity today. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for hosting. Nice to meet you again. <laughs> cool. Um, we first met at EdCon this year, so probably about six months ago, um, and uh, had really good talk about kind of like, you know, L2 landscapes and L1 landscapes and so on. So we'll definitely get into that a bit later. But um, for everyone who doesn't know you, tell us a bit about your background. Um, it's also glad to meet you. And also your background is very impressive. I remember our long conversation debating around like layer two and layer one. Okay, sure. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ye. Uh, uh, I'm the co-founder of Scroll. Um, my background is more from academic. Uh, I work on ZK and crypto before. So uh, I think before like three years before Scroll, I was working on um, purely on the owner proof research. Uh, I work on hardware acceleration for the owner proof because five years ago, that's the biggest bottleneck for using the owner proof in practice because the proof generation is just so slow. It takes like several minutes or several hours to generate proof for any computation, uh, any program. So my, my first task is like use hardware like GPU and ASIC to make this proof generation faster to solve this kind of poor efficiency problem. And later I work more on the theoretical side, looking to how like how this kind of magic works, like how you generate proof, how you compress a large program into a very distinct proof, a more like theoretical construction. And later, like, you know, I, because, you know, the, the most fundamental problem of efficiency has been improved for order of magnitude. So that's why I moved to more on the kind of application side where uh, how we can use this kind of magic technology to scale for privacy and for use cases. So my background is more on the kind of ZK research side uh, like around hardware acceleration for ZK, a theoretical construction behind ZK and ZK applications. Um, at Scroll, I mainly work on uh, like ZK research um, and some some strategy stuff uh, to to bridge between non tech and tech. Um, yeah, that's so about me. Tell tell us about the hardware limitations um, that we currently face for um, ZK uh, technology. So wh why why does it place um, so big a burden on regular CPUs, and why have why did you resort to uh, GPUs? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and uh, uh, I think so. So just a high level context. So um, the only proof is that where you can generate proof for. So you have a program, and uh, but it's like too large to to execute for for verifier. For example, like I'm on a phone, I'm on a device where I can't execute the program myself. So there is a prover uh, which it will generate proof to prove that uh, it executes the program correctly. Uh, this, this is the result, this is a proof, and you only need to verify the proof very efficiently. So in this case, prover is more like a powerful machine where it can execute the program and generate proof to save verifies uh, effort to, to kind of re-execute. Without re-executing, you know the result is correct. But the magic comes at some trade-off where, because you, you can't just magically save one's cost. So the, the cost is that the prover need to generate proof with a much larger cost. So imagine that the program um, like execution takes like for example one second, and then like the proof generation might take hours time. So which is like one second or even larger overhead to generate proof. So which means like initially prover only need to run like this program like very quickly, but but generate proof is like you need to pay for one second times overhead to just to save verifies kind of effort. And this kind of computation for generating proof 
involved in a lot of operations on elliptic curve. It's based on something called probabilistic shadow proof, um, and uh, it would map into a lot of operations on elliptic curve, which involve large finite, like large finite field operation, like you know, modular um, 256 bit large integer, and that's very very expensive. Um, but luckily, it's very very easy to parallelize because. Uh, so that's why, like you know, using GPU and and FPGA or ASIC can make this become like order of magnitude faster. Um, and we are the first one to kind of work, tackle this problem from from a more academic uh, like perspective and decompose proving into several components. Some some components are like elliptic curve operations, um, and some operations are like FFT over finite field. And we can make both parts become uh, significantly faster. And then the end to end proof generation can be like order of magnitude faster. So then like practically you just run this proof generation over ha hardware and then like everything got, got, get, get really fast. And currently the state of art is that a lot of like companies are building different solutions. Some are more ASIC driven like SISIC, Excel, they are, they are more leaning towards this ASIC solution, which is highly customized um, and super fast. Um, but a lot of like open source invitation like from from super rational, from from a lot of teams, um, are more like GPU based, and that can also achieve a very very significant um, speed up, uh, like ten times or even one hundred times, compared with um, depending on your device. So the magic is in the parallelization. Yes, yes, exactly. Perfect, cool. Um, so you guys started uh, twenty twenty one, and when I say you guys, I say I mean you and your co founders Sandy and Hai Chen. Um, how did you three meet? Yeah, uh, I think that's a very uh, different story. Like we, we, we actually first meet, meet online. So my background, as I mentioned, like I was working on Academic, I was working on ZK purely into that rabbit hole. And the other two co co-founders, Sandy and Hai Chen, we work on totally three totally different separate area. Sandy is more working on the uh, like business side, uh, like non-tech side, ecosystem building side. And uh, like Hai Chen is more leading the engineer effort. So it's very interesting that we we met actually through the ECM community because Sandy has been doing like before Scroll he has been like you know doing his own her own startup and doing regulation stuff and uh, doing a lot of investment in crypto and uh, he is a she is more like a builder in, in the whole ecosystem and she has been paying attention to the whole you know what's happening in the crypto world he, she noticed that there might be a huge opportunity to layer two because layer two will become the entry point for billion of users to enter Ethereum because Ethereum is just very, very expensive for normal ordinary user to use. So there is a huge opportunity there to, to scale using layer two. And then like I would build in like, you know, like thinking about um, how to improve provers efficiency to kind of uh, scale Ethereum in a general, like more general purpose way. And then like Haishan is more leading some engineer effort. He he has a PhD in system from, uh, from, from University, of, University of Washington. He has been like working on AI and building system, but his system is very comprehensive. He builds system including like GPU, compiler. It's a very, very complex system and uh, turning that into product. So it's more like what research, which you know, have pro proof of concept idea, have you know research and architecture idea. One is like can actually turn this idea into implementation, into product level uh, like system. And then you know like how to kind of, you know, like how you scale, how to fit this kind of technical uh, component into the whole um, like Ethereum scaling like in diagram. Three of us are both in like uh, I met Sandy through Ethereum community. We actually met through uh, Ethereum research forum, which I, I post some early idea for. Oh, here is you know how you can scale Ethereum, and here is you know how you can accelerate prover, um, and how you make that possible. Um, and then like I met Hachin through like also like it, our common friend is in Ethereum community, and also like he he has been doing some. Like competitive programming um, and mass, you know, like competition. So that's how we connect, um, and uh, it's more like very organic and very kind of yeah, you know, like different not a different way where there's a research forum, there's community discussion, and then we we talk about this interesting idea and why it's possible now. And the three of us just met online, start to kind of okay, so let's work on this, and then gradually it grows like you know totally unaffected, but yeah. That's a different story. That's a super cool origin story because kind of like purely online. I think it's maybe also a COVID story because it happened in 2021. Yeah, that's right? definitely so, a big, yeah. 
yeah. So kind of real life events were kind of suspended um, for a while. Um, but yeah, to me, it's really amazing because kind of co-founding with someone, um, it's a very intimate relationship, right? So basically you have to work really well as a team. And I yeah. think kind of finding that purely online, that is that is such a cool story. Um, how was it when you guys met for the first time? I think we still have some, like share some common friends, but all the discussions happen like in the, you know, either research forum or like in the community discussion around like layer two scaling. And then like, we feel like the value is pretty aligned. We want to scale Yixuan and we observe that there is a very vibrant Yixuan research community there. Like that's why I'm attracted. And there is a vibrant ecosystem there like in Yixuan. And that, that's why how Sandy is attracted and Haishin saying this technology is so amazing. I want to turn that into a system. So it's like, there's still some common friends, but you know, it's more like community thing. And then like people meet and uh, like got to know each other and uh, yeah. Yeah. But you guys have met in person, right? Yes. Yes. It's only after, I think the, the earliest in-person meetup is in DevConnect in Amsterdam, where that's the first time we formally met. So that was met. 2022? Um, yes. Yes. I think so. Cool. What Scroll puts front and center is that it is EVM compatible. What drove you to this decision? Because, I mean, we recently spoke with um, a number of other ZK rollups, and um, some of some of which kind of also went this route, like Hermes uh, with uh, with uh, Jordi now uh, Polygon ZK 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 EVM, but um, others haven't. So kind of like for instance, um, re we recently had on Aztec and um, Ellie from Starknet, and they were adamant that. Um, the efficiency losses that you suffer from doing an opcode by opcode based translation is not worth it. Um, so how, how did you kind of settle on this design choice? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I think uh, a big a big part of that is that, like, you know, think about your motivation from first principle, like, you know, why you want to even build a layer two solution. So. Um, I think for me that we observe that ECM is congested and it's very expensive and uh, applications on ECM want to find a place where it, it's very cheap, it's ultra secure, it's in high security from ECM. So that's why we think, you know, like reducing the effort that applications can find such a solution is the way to go. And also like I think from, and like, so that's, that's our first motivation, like why we want to build a very seamless um, scaling solution that all the developer, all the users can reuse everything they have to migrate to to scroll in a seamless manner, and the users can reuse all their familiar like you know toolings, and uh, and developer can use their kind of you know, foundry and all those toolings directly, and uh, and also like th so that's the first intuition where we don't want anyone to change any of their kind of habit to only get the benefits which is faster, um, cheaper, um, with a faster like you know like pre-confirmation time and high throughput. Um, so that's our first um, intuition. And second thing is that I think it's actually from the security perspective where EVM has not only has an ecosystem, but also has proven itself from years of, of, of time where, you know, like all the all the application deploy on this model, um, like hasn't been, there hasn't been any, any problem with that. Um, so that's why like we think inheriting the security from this kind of test of time model is very important. Even like we we are reusing to the code level, where we are trying to uh, reuse the code, the the kind of node implementation from Ethereum. We are trying to use Go Ethereum, which is uh, Ethereum's client implementation to generate block, um, to generate our block, to make sure that the behavior is exactly the same. So using that is definitely increase the, the security, and also because developers don't need to change any line of their code. So like if, imagine like you know if every layer to require you to make a significant change to your code then like maybe large legit application like Uniswap, Aave might worry that, you know, why should I migrate to this chain with uh, some risk in changing my code and redoing this re-audit. So that's why like we think this is very important. And uh, and also like I think EVM just have way more like toolings than like any other VM has. Like even if you think, you know, Starkware has, has put a lot of effort in kind of Carl, but like if you think about how many implementation, how many toolings you can use to deploy on, on, on Cairo, like it's very limited compared with, with the whole EVM ecosystem. Um, so that's another thing which 
um, you know, like inherit the ecosystem, build your own network effect, and then like only then like you can think about you know what things you can you can provide some actual value to to the developer in your community. And I think one last last thing is that uh, this even distinguishes us from several other um, like language compatible ZKROP is that we we are like bytecode level compatible with the EVM. So which means like per opcode we will have some circuit mapping to kind of uh, prove on the bytecode level. Um, so uh, and and reuse all the kind of implementation like go ECM to kind of generate our block block. So this guarantee us that every time ECM is doing any upgrade, it's very easy to apply to our chain. Like for example, like you know there is there is some kind of EIP, there's hard fork, and it's easy for us to adopt those changes if we are EVM. But if you are totally work on a different path, it's very hard to kind of follow what is what, what the ECM layer one is doing, adopt all the innovations from the ECM community. So even if like you know there's so many innovations like new pre-compiles, uh, new discussions around like you know ECM layer one, and we can directly take all those innovations and apply that to layer two. Even some like infrastructure like 4337, PBS, all those kind of great ideas like MEV, all those kind of infrastructure to solve those problems can be reused on our scroll directly. So that's why like you can always you know stay up to date with being very ECM aligned, reuse all the innovations from the research community without too much fragmentation. Um, and uh, eventually I think you know layer two might become uh, especially us might become the 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 kind of like we can go even one one step ahead of ECM to test some kind of EIPs and uh, adopt some innovations. And then like if it's proven to be successful, then like maybe ECM has a larger possibility to to kind of adopt to push this innovation. So always stay ahead, always stay on top of this kind of nice solutions and uh, to benefit the whole um, ECM community. So yeah, there are multiple reasons, but that's all like you know I can I can think about definitely like TLDI is that developer and user experience is the same. Security model is the same. Ecosystem and toolings are more vibrant. And last thing is like you know, stay always ahead on, on this innovation and research, um, and benefit eventually benefit the whole ECM community. And I hear that a hundred percent. But c- can I just kind of um, poke into this a bit more? So, if if you kind of look at um, what would you say the efficiency gains you could get from not using a ZK EVM would be? And kind of, is there any way kind of to make up the efficiency you're losing with respect to um, other rollups that are using more optimized languages? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think that's actually the biggest um, like reason why you know, div- like so many rollups want to choose other uh, virtual machine model because they used to think like, you know, being bytecode level compatible, building such a ZK EVM, will have a significantly larger overhead. Maybe they, they are imagining like 10 times maybe, like 100 times maybe, like larger overhead than their, their kind of leaky virtual machine. But the rela- reality is that I think they didn't expect, even like us didn't expect, like the prover technology has been improved so much. I, I think two years ago, two or three years ago, I think when we start scroll, compared with five years ago, where the technology of ZK lies, it's like, the efficiency of Pura has been improved for three order of magnitude, like by this kind of advanced proving system, by the underlying hardware acceleration, by proof recursion. So the efficiency has already been improved for like once on the times. So that's why I think compared with different ZK virtual machine, I don't think ZK EVM, by code level ZK EVM had that much overhead. I think at most probably like two, two or three times, even like sometimes like can be even lower. And that's only talking about the poor cost, which is not the dominant cost for a layer two transaction. So think, imagine like, you know, for, for our kind of layer two transaction, if you want to put data on chain, that might take uh, the majority of the cost, which is over 90% of the, the cost. And then like among the kind of rest of 10% of time, you know, like maybe using some other ZK VM can save the proving cost for like two times, three times. And that's only portion, one portion of this 10%. Which means, like you know, it won't differ that much, even if you are using other ZK virtual machines. But the the, the hugest loss is that you lose compatibility, and uh, you have to rebuild your ecosystem from scratch. So, and you will really suffer from that. So I think that's why I don't see kind of too much loss on the on the on the prover side. 
Um, and uh, the, especially with the technology keep improving and we predict like the, the Zeki technology will still improve for another 10 times. Like in, uh, my prediction is that in, in six months or one year, we can make a 10 times even faster Zeki VM. So it's it's not really not that painful as, as people predict like five years ago. So, so you think it's kind of, is it fair to kind of compare this to say, um, no longer building um, applications in C++ uh, just because, I mean, just because C++ may be a little bit more efficient at some things and um, kind of the convenience and the developer mind share that you kind of get with more um, common developer languages more than makes up for this. So you, uh, are you talking about like using C++ to write smart contract versus Solidity or like... Oh, no, 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 not smart, uh, not smart contracts, just general, uh, general code. I mean, so basically I went to university a while ago and back then um, whenever we kind of took home large batches of data, obviously C++ was kind of the go-to thing to kind of use just because it was much more efficient than Python, for instance. Um, uh, but you, you're saying that kind of uh, using Python and other more convenient languages for developers, um, th this is kind of the parallel, right? Kind of, it's kind of like you, you, you're saying kind of the technology has made such tremendous advancements that kind of the factor two or three that you're possibly losing doesn't really matter much. Yeah, in some sense, yes. Like we want to keep the kind of Python level developer experience, but magically reduce the overhead of backend to some degree that, you know, it doesn't matter, like, you know, you optimize safely for C++ because that doesn't really influence your overall cost in some sense, yes. But it's more similar to, like, I think other VM are trying to kind of, um, like, compel, like, I, I, I think, like, it, it's very similar. But one thing which uh, is quite different is that um, if you run C++ plus and Python, uh, like the, the the complexity, the underlying like CPU is like still like influence some efficiency. But here, like especially if you are looking at the transaction cost, it's not just execution cost; it's also like data cost, which means like make this kind of difference become even smaller because it's like five percent among all the cost, and then you save this five percent to some degree, but you know you you give up like this compatibility, either user concern, but the transaction cost overall will be similar. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I want to talk about kind of how the cost for an L2 transaction is made up later and kind of talk about data availability then. So kind of I, I would like to table this for now. Um, let's talk about kind of the the uh, creation of Scroll a little bit more. So I remember the ECC presentation where, where Jody for the first time um, talked about building a uh, opcode by opcode transposition into a ZK EVM that was in June 2021 blew everyone's minds um how did you how did you guys fit into your timeline because I know scrollers scrollers also founded in 2021 yeah that's a that's a really great question so I think a lot of people are like maybe don't know the, the the story behind I think I think what we started we start in early 2022 in January I think that that's the earliest we have this idea for we want to build a layer two but the first idea of Scroll is that because we have this hardware idea in mind, so we want to design some de decentralized prover network where we can use a network of miners or provers to generate proof for us, to provide enough computation power for us to generate proof for large applications. So that's our initial idea. Firstly, having this ar architecture, and then the EVM, the EVM is just application. And then initially, we are thinking about more, even in, the, in our initial policy in I think in April 2021, it's talking about like ZK virtual machine, how you ZK CPU, how that you know cycle works. But later, I think I talked with uh, I, I met I met Barry from ECM Foundation, who is like who actually invented ZK Rob the the, the the concept of of ZK Rob. Barry Whitehead, of, right? Yeah, Barry Whitehead. Yeah, and uh, he 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 has been thinking through like whether ZK VM is possible, whether bico level like ZK VM is possible or not, and then like we. Like he, he he read our documentation and then like say, said okay so if you also want to build something like this we also had some idea why not like you know we collaborate on this and then like share if you think this is the right approach to to build why don't we just build in the open everything is open source and then like just build that I think at that time that's where I think all the ZKVM even including like like Hermes like the the idea for from 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 Jordy 
like all start from there. So I think it's Barry is discussing some with someone else to about this idea for how you use lookup to solve the biggest problem for read and write to storage because because in, like in Xenon proof you need to prove um, program for for some static program which for example you have some sorting you, you prove this fixed program but the VM needs to read and write the state the storage and that mapping is very costly because you need to use a Merkle tree every time you read from an element you need to prove a Merkle tree branch and the idea is that we can use lookup to solve this problem like totally like because you only need to build a lookup table and then you can do efficient batch lookup to into that that, that table and that's where all the ideas come from, including like Jordi's. I think Barry has been talking with a lot of teams, like including like Jordi, us, as well as some other layer two teams. Um, and then we are the first one to commit to want to build in the open, and uh, we want to kind of build with with their team um, as as exploration to kind of because we believe that building the public is a, one of the core spirit of of Instagram community. Why it's so vibrant, like because people can kind of contribute freely, people can kind of collaborate freely. And then I think um, Jordi is more leaning towards uh, like stack based approach, but the architecture is very, very similar. It's all originated from the, the like the, the very like old doc where you use lookup to solve this problem. And then like he is, he, like I think then like he's back out, like he want to use Stark, he takes some d- different design choices and then like he choose to like build, build, build with, with, with Polygon and build their own, like um, I think he, he built their own like uh, instruction set to and also interpreter to interpret bytecode into that instruction set, but we are more firmly believe that directly build circuit for each opcode so that you can have per opcode mapping. You don't need to build any interpreter. You don't need to build um, a, a sequencer from scratch. You can reuse everything that Instagram has. So that's why like um, us and the PSE team, uh, which is short for Privacy and Scaling Exploration Team, uh, led by Barry Whitehead, um, work towards the direction where it's opcode level compatible, maximum the usability of layer one sequencer, and then Jordi uh, leads towards uh, a stack based um, backend and some kind of um, other instruction set with an interpreter, um, but still like with this kind of bytecode level compatibility. So that's where different approaches differ, but it's all actually arranged from the bricks or the idea for, okay, use lookup to do this, use custom gate to kind of express your your opcodes. So it's very similar. It's I think it's exactly the same timeline actually. Like because um I uh, I remember like you know Barry is talking with, with with many teams about you know whether they are interested in kind of building this together. Um but there will be different considerations behind teams around like how this need to be built. Um and uh, like different design choices and we are more aligned on the other side like you know use this kind of KZG, use snark, use maximum usability and build something like in the public. So yeah, that, 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 that's a difference. But everyone starts the, the same point with a similar architecture for how you handle this memory thing. Yeah, this is uh, super interesting to kind of hear that it kind of all started with um, Barry Whitehead's idea of kind of how to do the lookup. Um, so you guys recently kicked off your mainnet, if I remember cor- correctly, it was um, mid-October. Um, so tell us about that. Yeah, uh, it, it has been a really, really long journey um, from, from start to to mid. Um, I think we, we, we officially launched in, the Genesis happens in like uh, October 10th and uh, we we encode uh, some, like the, the future is open using uh, like a word language um, to, to, to express that, you know, we think the word need to be connected, it's global and uh, the future is open. Um, and then like, I think the official opening is on um, mid October. Um, I think, before I, it, it's it's really exciting. Like the whole team is in in Vietnam doing some offsite. Like we we're actually there, like celebrating in person with each other. Like because it's a joint effort, not only like research, not only engineering, but also like the whole team in like BD, Devro, like Ops, all those different teams like joint force to to build this together. Not only a product, but also like not only a, like just an engineer effort, but but a, it's a it's a community effort. Um, I think we we have been like really doing a lot a lot of like preparation to make this happen. Like our testnet has been running for over like fifteen months from pre alpha testnet to alpha testnet to beta testnet, a lot of upgrades, a lot of testing. 
I think we like before man, before Mana launch, we are very nervous about you know the security because you are really launching something, playing with like users' assets. Like users can really deposit their money on your chain. You really need to be responsible. So we we pay huge attention to like security monitoring system, everything else to to kind of make sure it's a successful launch. We have done like for example, we we even like before we launch, we fetched in our testing environment. We fetched all the transactions from from Polygon, from Binance, from from different chains that to kind of replay our in our testing environment to make sure that we can generate proof for those transactions to kind of stress test um, and also like we 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 spend a quite uh, amount of money on auditing like internal and external. Internally, we have some kind of red team to looking keep looking for bugs attacking our te- our our test net and uh, the environment and how to make fake proof how to kind of attack the system and externally there is like we contract the best the world class level of like auditor like including like open zeppelin zalic for 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 node and and the contract auditing a lot of companies like that we also like set up like one million dollar bug bounty to, to for, for for the community to spot any bugs in our, in our system so it's like a lot of preparation um and also like we our team has been like you know talking with a lot of project to to deploy and test their application on Cipolia. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's all like it's a very exciting moment that you turn you literally turn some open source project open source demo to a product uh, like uh, like a, like one hundred percent like ready product online. So I think that's a very very like incredible journey for me. And also like you see like you know your your research results from from paper to a product and used by a lot of people so it's 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 quite exciting and we are really looking forward to kind of things after like you know how we build a community how we keep improving the tech um yeah i think it's yeah it's it's really a moment that we we can't we, we will remember like forever like you know it's launched and uh, very exciting yeah congratulations on that um tell us about um the scroll commun- community so kind of who is your community and do you have people who are building on Scroll exclusively? Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. So first thing, I think my my definition for community is that uh, there will be like engineers and researchers who are part of like, they can build their own product. Uh, they can build their own project. They can do their own research. But we we communicate, we collaborate, we talk in the open, we call build some kind of talk about some, some benchmark stuff. So those are, I think, a part of our community. And by, for example, we are hosting the Symposium, which is like, uh, um, like due to the mandate is currently recently reduced the frequency a little bit, but we will catch up very soon. Is that previously it's like um, bi-weekly cadence where we invite the ZK researchers uh, and application developer to talk about their idea for building, building ZK, uh, b- like what applications they are building using ZK. Because I think a lot of, if, if you look at Twitter, like all the kind of places where people only like talk about like some marketing material. We are talk about how great they are, like how how fast they are, like why they can achieve like you know one hundred percent privacy, all those stuff. But no one really dig into details about the architecture and want to build a like a place where people can like dive really really deep into like what they are building and the architecture stuff. So I think it more happens in like Ziki Study Club where people dive into like like. Uh, very academic papers, some mathematical constructions, but very few people have some place to share very deeply about ZK application ideas, like how they build this app, ZK application, what technology they are using, what the architecture look like. And then that's where ZK Symposium sit, where people have one hour time to, to present their idea in depth about what application they, they are building in ZK technology, and then people can like ask questions. So I think th- those are like, in that way, we are building a like, research community, and also because everything is built in the open, like as I mentioned, like our our ZKVM reuse all the toolings from, for example, like the proving library is from from Zcash team, and there are a lot of other teams like also building on top of this 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 crypto library. That those are also I consider as part of our community, like ZK community to to build. That's what one part. And second part is more like developer community where people deploy the applications. And we introduced after after Manet, we introduced uh, something called Scroll or Enjoy NFT. Um, so usually I'm not a big fan of 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 this kind of NFT thing, but it's actually a soul bond where if you deploy applications, uh, you 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 are early in our ecosystem, 
you you can claim your like you know one really cool scroll or engine FT from from us. I, I think that design. Uh, I, I don't know if you, you have noticed is that it's totally different from like just images. Like usually NFT are just images stored somewhere else, and then you put some kind of link on, on chain, which is a, a fake NFT. What we do is that we do something similar to like Uniswap V3, which is a generative curve. Uh, it's a polynomial where if you deploy your contract, you be, because the time you deployed because of the kind of uh, the sequence, like how many contract you are deployed, then like you, you can get a different polynomial. And then like we can draw this polynomial uh, like on chain, like, you know, you, you get a different, like uh, uh, I, I think if you deploy earlier, that the, the degree will be four or five. I, I can't remember. So it's like you get this kind of curve with, with different like, uh, so many kind of turning points and uh, to show that you are early in our ecosystem and we really appreciate our effort um, because, you know, being in an ecosystem early is definitely introduce some risk for, okay, so whether it's battle tested or not. So we welcome the early builders to, to join our ecosystem. That's only for welcome and uh, like to prove that you are, you are there and you are there earlier. And so it, like everything we do is like, I think it's very cool and very, it's based on like fundamentals that make as possible, which is zero-node proof and the polynomials. And then like, you know, application, you deploy, you get a polynomial, you get an NFT, like, you know, which, you know, draw this kind of really cool polynomial. I think that that, that will definitely introduce some kind of, a lot of people just trying to, trying to kind of deploy maybe a bunch of like ERC-20 contracts, but that's within our prediction. Our, our, our kind of mo motivation obje objective is that encourage more people to try deploy your first app, first contract and in a neutral way. It's not like we select, oh, we give you this, we give you that in an unfair way, but we we are more, we are, we, we want to hold this kind of like a blockchain's principle of being incredibly neutral and then people, every people you deploy, you, you can get something as, and also experience like how seamless that is. So I think that's, that's something like which there are some community from there uh, and also like there are some more native applications which um, we share the same value and then they believe that, you know, we believe our value of being open, being community driven, being incredibly neutral, and then they come to us because we, we, we don't provide brand to applications specifically because we think that will make your ecosystem become a zero sum game because basically like there will always be new chains, like new layer one, new layer two, they always launch their, their token with, they, they raise a lot, bunch of money. They can give a lot to, to new developer. Like I give you this money, you come to our chain to deploy. But then like it will become a competing game, which I give you this amount, the other chain give you that amount, and then you go to the other chain. And it, it seems like it, it's not like we are, we are making the whole ecosystem grow. We are like making this kind of small pie for crypto larger, but it's more like I want to compete with, with, with each other. So what we want to do is that we want to attract, we want to focus on like building stuff and attract more organic community where, you know, they are very organically attracted by us because they see like there is a huge opportunity on scroll by being early. And uh, and also like it's one of the most legit and general purpose like top top layer too. And there will be a huge opportunity there. So what we are focusing on is that we introduce, we, we make, we get everything ready for developers. For example, like we have Etherscan support. Um, so users and developers can use your most familiar infrastructure. We get Chainlink as Oracle support, which means like, you know, all the kind of DeFi can use your, your most familiar Oracle. We get uh, we, we get all the kind of indexing RPC provider ready. So that's something we will focus on, like build an environment that developer are easy to build, but we don't like enforce you to, to build like what we want. We, we just create this kind of foundation. We keep improving our documentation, tutorial, workshops. Um, and then like a lot of people are actually attracted by this. It's like um, for some more like commercialized application, for them, one is there is Versa, like, you know, there are some other wallets which are native to scroll. Um, and there are some like new DeFi, like Coke Finance and some other uh, financial applications on scroll. And uh, amazingly, it's like a lot of like small AI games like happen to on scroll. Like I think days ago, like I don't know who, who built this, but it's, like there's a game called Chat NPC where you, you, you chat with an with AI image and then like you could try to negotiate through this conversation about how much you can get. So, and then like you end up, if you end up being, being high, you can get some score. It's, it's a very simple game, but it's very fun. So I think being fun is really one important way to attract, attract builders. 
I, I think a lot of uh, I know like a lot of like applications are still building the because the more serious, the more like uh, commercialized, the more ready the project is. Uh, it will take a longer time to to build and being ready. But for for every love who is listening, like pay attention to our ecosystem account, our main account. Uh, you will notice a lot of good opportunities, good projects that building on top of us, which will come out in the next a few months. Um, and in terms of like, we also support a lot of grassroots hackathons. We have been, I, I think we we probably participate over like twenty hackathons, maybe like around the world, like everywhere almost. And then like we, the, a very recent one is that um, East Global in New York. We it's the first time that we surpassed all the all other chains in terms of deployment and uh, with a small price. So usually like, you know, it's it's not just, you know, people offer higher price, so people deploy on you. But if I realize EVM, um, and then like you can provide something kind of subtle changes or like something cool, like you, you get the most deployment and then like it's very welcome in this kind of hacker group. And uh, it, it's very exciting because it's even like before our mainnet launch where a lot of other chains have all those kind of even better infrastructure support, but we can still get so many hackers interested in kind of building on top of us. I think it's definitely something like which we are kind of celebrating, like um, because this is very organic grassroots hackathon project. Uh, I do believe that in this way, like you can you can grow your grassroots community to a large extent. So those are like the all developer communities we have, you know, including like as I mentioned, like some wallets, some some games, some some kind of um, like DeFi applications, um, and uh, there's a lot of hackathon groups, um, and uh, uh, other other step. I think looking forward, we will um, expect more regional community. So we will start seriously building community in, in several places, uh, including uh, like Turkey, uh, Nigeria, uh, Malaysia, and uh, Argentina. That's our 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 plan for like where we seriously want to put some effort in. To grow the community there, because um, our, our our mission is really to scale, um, to scale Ethereum to sometimes like you know if you have like we want to codify trust and uh, like empower this ownership for for individual and achieve financial inclusion. So and uh, y- you see that all the blockchains are not scalable enough for billion of users for even like they they don't even know like where all those one billion users come from. Um, so we have very clear goal for how to get those users because the, the, the users like who need crypto are where the 1 billion people really come from. And uh, you do see like, you know, in US, in, in, in even in China, in some kind of other more, like in Europe, a lot of places, people don't really need crypto um, because they have really established like financial system. They only do that for cross-border like, you know, payment and maybe people use that. But in a lot of places like like Africa, like you know, I have been there for 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 ten days for this layer two trip, um, to really understand like how people are using crypto in practice. You figure out that a lot of people are really suffer from this kind of currency inflation, and uh, they have a lot of problems that can be tackled by blockchain. We really want to kind of help those users and onboard user use those users to Ethereum ecosystem. Um, so that's why like we we selectively choose those places which. They suffer from the the problems of, and they have real need for crypto. Um, and then, like we want to double down effort in building regional community. And uh, eventually, I think I I'm imagine like in, in a few few months or like a few years, Scroll will be think about as a the layer two that has the most real users coming from developing countries, from 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 some places in Asia, some so all those places where if application come to deploy, they know that there is real user there. It's not just the same group of people like you know migrating from this chain to that chain because it's a new chain. So that's our like mission. And I, I consider that to be part of our community. But we are still building that. We we just started on, on Turkey, but we was like putting some more like um so if you look at like you know this year a lot of like project pulls out to from 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 Dem Connect. Um but we are still like building a very, very large, probably largest ever event called Layer 2 Day with Layer 2 Beat. Uh, we are co-hosting that. Um, it's like over 2,000 people capacity to to kind of talk about layer twos. And we are seriously building a community starting from Turkey, but other places we will, uh, if you are like, you know, in the real regions, you really want to change change people's life there, then like, you know, you can you can talk with us and we, we, we want to kind of build community there. Seriously, we are, I think, I see like where our community can come from. Okay, so basically 
what what you're saying is you're trying to grow uh, the community organically um, yes. through culture rather than through kind of like monetary incentives, which is kind of often the way that it goes in crypto. Yes. Um, speaking of incentives, what's this the token situation for Scroll? Yeah, it's uh, for our legal reason. Like you know, we 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 haven't like you know uh, really publicly you know. I, I, I'm more thinking like you know, it, it's more like a mechanism where think about like why you why you even need this like you know maybe there are some reasons for design sequencer design prover but there might be some other 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 models for that so uh, I think we are still uh, thinking through what's the best mechanism and uh, and uh, like incentive model for for our system to work the best instead of okay so just. This, this this token thing, but yeah, we, we we have been working on some mechanism design which um, aligned with our system to make our system become more stable and more usable. But you know, for some legal or some some other concerns, like you know, we are not yeah. But but currently, gas on scroll is paid in ETH. Yes, yes. You already alluded to it um, in your last answer. Um, you currently still have centralized sequences. It's kind of, it's been normalized over the last like year or two. Um, but in principle, what it means is that you kind of, you have one or several permissioned um, sequences, uh, people who can, or entities who can actually build blocks, which is very much not what blockchains should strive to, because kind of in the, in terms of decentralized, decentralization, kind of your least decentralized um, component kind of, determines how decentralized like the entire c system is right and so if you have one centralized sequencer you have e essentially the entire chain is built by a single entity um what what are your plans towards decentralization yeah that, that that's a great question so i definitely agree that you know that's in some sense like it's different from like how normally like a layer layer one blockchain works and like why only f a few parties can can produce block um, but I think it, when I think about this decentralization problem, I, I think about like, you know, again, like from first principle, like why you need decentralization. And there are several reasons. Like in layer two context, yeah, specifically, there are like maybe maybe three aspects. I, I think one is a sequencer who generates a block, who, you, so who can you know, produce a block and uh, like then pass that to prover. Prover is basically generate a decade proof for each block um, to prove that, okay, so all the transactions inside this block is valid. And then, like finally, some this 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 block and the proof on chain, and then on chain verifier will verify this. So there are two parties: one is sequencer, journey block; one is prover, like journey proofs. And the uh, two parts definitely need to be decentralized, but for different reasons. So for for a sequencer, the reason is that so actually, like one one thing, like you know, just to to add to this is that even if we are using a centralized sequencer, um, like what every layer two is is is, is doing is that it doesn't influence your users fund security because if you think about like so what, what the bad things can do like from a sequencer perspective so you can set a transaction sequencer include that transaction in a block prove a genetic block a genetic proof for this block so if we are operating a sequencer we want to do something bad right if we insert a bad transaction then we can't generate proof for this bad transaction because you know the case the case proof will kind of only attest to uh like the right Transactions, the valid transaction, so we can't insert any bad bad transaction. So that's number one. Because of zk proof, you can't do something bad. Second thing is that what you can do is that you can censor transaction. If user send your transaction to a central sequencer, central sequencer say no, I want to include you. Um, but that can be like you know solved by okay. So if user find that one one layer to don't accept their transaction, it can send this transaction on chain, and then like layer one. Like verifier will enforce that if you don't include this transaction in maybe twenty four days, then anyone can submit the block. So in that way, like you know, you can avoid this kind of censorship resistant problem. Like, uh, and and users will never suffer from the problem of you can't withdraw a fund because you can always do that. We can't, you know, even if you reject, like you you, you can you can do that. And then, so let's go back to so censorship sequencer that influence the the system's kind of security, but what it really influences that. Uh, there are some sensors like real-time censorship resistant problem. So imagine like you know you will be liquidated in the next one minute. You send a transaction to to deposit some money, but then we reject, and then you are liquidated. 
and then even if like we, your transaction is like guaranteed to be included in in next a few blocks, it doesn't really matter because you're already being liquidated. So that's a problem, and that's where you can use design sequencer to 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 help. But again, like there are still maybe some other way to solve this problem. Maybe you can encrypt your use some equipment pool where you increase the transaction where sequencer can't distinguish which transaction which and then it had to include and then like after decryption you know like what's what's included that can also solve this problem right so like it's decentralization sequencer is a tool not like we have to kind of oh we we have to for decentralization we decentralize but it's for solving some problems and we we do think that's a promising way to solve this real-time censorship resistance problem and also, there might be some legal legal issues where there are multiple like you know entities running sequencer in different regions. Then like the, the risk for like being more censorship resistant um, can be reduced. So that's for sequencer. And for the prover, um, there are some kind of problems. The thing that it can solve is that it can scale, It can be very scalable. Uh, where imagine that there is a network of 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 miner or, or prover running running or kind of proving proving algorithm. So it's very different from proof of work, even if you also have a high requirement for hardware, because the key proof is that like proof of work is basically like 10,000 people computing for the same randomness and then who get the answer, who can submit. But the key proof is that you have a fixed deterministic algorithm and anyone can execute and get it and that's it. So it's, it's, it's quite different. And uh, so in terms of, it's more like outsourced computation, outsource this useful computation to the provers. And then like having this decentralized prover network can help you um, to kind of having some backup if you know one prover party just like goes down. Um, and then like other other prover can still generate proof for you. So you have some backup, you have some more stronger liveness guarantee, and also you don't need to buy machines yourself. It, it's more scalable, like people can use their own machines to generate proof. Yeah, it's more resilient. Um so kind of to to actually gain the forced inclusion that you talked about earlier, if you're being censored on on the L2, um, you need to make all transaction data available um, on the L1. So basically, this is kind of why we're now getting um, dank sharding with blobs, where kind of data um, is is gonna get uh, where temporary data is gonna get much cheaper and so on. Um, but it's still um, the main cost driver for L2s. So it's on the order of 95% or upwards of that as compared to kind of just um, the check-ins that you kind of need to do to kind of prove the state, right? So there's a couple of L2s um, that kind of have gone the Validium route recently um, where basically they decided to not actually post all transaction data to L1 just because it kind of drives up um, price on the L2. Currently prices aren't crazy, Um but I mean, they have been crazy in the past. They'll probably become crazy again at some point, which will kind of mean that lots of applications that are currently viable, kind of like the AI game where you kind of you negotiate with uh, an NPC, they will no longer be viable on L2, right? So f w what's what's your strategy there? So I mean, basically, even when dank sharding comes, call data will become maybe 10 times cheaper or so. But this is still pretty expensive for lots of applications. So, w what are your thoughts on kind of going the Validium route? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So, I, I think for this Validium, I think so. I, I think Validium definitely trade off some security for being cheaper. But for for us, I think currently we are sticking to I, I think Scrolls main chain will stick to posting data on Ethereum and strictly inherit the same security from Ethereum. Um, so because because our I, I think for most row up, like different row up can have different value proposition. I think for us it's always like security first is always like drive most of our design decisions, including like that's why we, we do this audit in this way, we open source in this way, we have bug bounty in this way. So it drives almost all the decisions because we do feel like there will be a, a crucial amount of applications that need this level of guarantee. And then, like we, we we make this become our first priority. So for a long, for for quite a long time, we will stick to this, um, like approach and get the what we, we what we think is that I think Vitalik is recently just posted a blog post about like different layer tools, and there is actually a spectrum for what applications need like on the on the kind of left hand side. There's a key store, you know, which is a 
uh, the fundamentals of, of all the smart contract wallets, storing their keys, key mappings, key value mappings, which need extremely high security. Um, and then there's ENS, which store your identity information. And then the more on the left side, the, the higher security you want, like maybe DeFi, institutional money, and some government, if they want to kind of issue some something important, they need security. On the right hand side, it might be gaming, like some NFT or some kind of those things. I think our value proposition is that score main chain will lie on the left side, hand side where we want to kind of attract more secure driven applications. And then like, you know, if Dank Sharding is not there yet, we, we, we might spare some effort in helping ECM to kind of build this solution for 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 all for everyone in the whole ecosystem. So that's that's our goal, like you know, how how we handle this situation. And if if we really reach the point for where Dank Sharding is not even enough. I do see like maybe some some other teams building layer three on top of us. They can be validium. They can kind of you know do other trade offs that on top of us. They can even use state diff, um, post data on yeah different way. Um, but that that's what I see like you know how this will will goes. It's like we will remain a very very high standard for security um to attract the most kind of legit large f- the most fundamental applications. And then like if you if game really really require you know, like high high throughput, or like extremely high throughput, or like that thing, they can build a layer three as validium on top of us. Um, and uh, like, I think it can be either can be layer three or some other other side solutions. Like at the same secure level, we were trying to kind of reduce the cost. Like for example, we are also working on data compression, like how you kind of compress the data you post on chain. So there are some way like which which you can reduce your your data post on chain become like three times smaller. So there are some way for, for doing compression. We are looking into that, how we, how we reduce the bridging cost. But everything like stands, like you can't like, you know, security should should always be the baseline and uh, it should be never something we will compromise. Do, do you think we'll be able to do data availability optimistically at some point? Because that would solve a lot of problems, right? So I, I think it still depends on the like secure assumption. I think for to me, like, you know, I think for scrolls main chain, like so, so firstly, I, I don't see any kind of very, very well established like uh, optimistic data availability solution, even if it's like, you know, there are teams like Eigenlayer Celestia is building some data solution. But I think it will still take some time to test whether this works or not, whether there are some other issue related to because I know like you have been running this infrastructure layer one, you know like how many things, some two things that is needed, like there's Oracle, RPC provider, all those things might require direct access to the data and ideally on the same chain. So you don't know like if you switch to the other solution, what the subtle changes you need to make and whether, and I, I, don't, I don't think they're all the, most of the solutions is mature, that mature enough for for main chain to migrate from. But I, I think we are still remaining optimistic. We will kind of always pay attention to like uh, the progress from other companies, from from other solutions. But right now we think, you know, it's it's not there yet. And we will stick to this kind of security principle and encourage all the kind of layer threes consider that as an option if you know you will have some trust assumption. Yeah. You posited earlier that there'll be um a whole ecosystem of L2s with um different trust assumptions and different associated costs. I agree that that's kind of like the the goal. But we we're currently very far away from that goal. So just before we started recording this uh this uh, podcast. A tweet from um, Joseph DeLong came out and it, it literally read, L2s don't actually scale Ethereum, they just fragmented into a bunch of unrelated chains. Obviously alluding to the fact that um, inter-L2 um, bridges um, currently are not operative. So basically the way to kind of go between L2s is to kind of bridge via Ethereum, which is obviously... Um, very costly. So in principle, it seems like um, bridging across different L2s should be possible because they have the same um, security assumptions in kind of building on top of um, Ethereum. When when do you think we'll get there and how do you see it happening? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think in terms of like in turbo, like between layer twos, I do think like people are, there are like two directions, like people are going towards um, it's it's orthogonal. It's not something that like, contradicts to each other. 
So one one approach is that as you describe, like you know, all the layer twos are based on Ethereum. So they post the same state root on, on Ethereum layer one. Um, so what you can do is that so for, especially for the Kiro up with, with with a faster like shorter finality is that imagine there's this Ethereum layer one. You you post two two state root like the, for, for example there is scroll there is like the other chain uh, A and B and then like what you can do to access B state is that you can read the state root of of another layer two from Ethereum layer one because your root is also there so you can read that and then provide a proof proving that the, the story slot the element you want to read from the other layer two is a like provide this Merkle path to that root and then you can trustlessly read and uh, like operate over the other chains like state so that's how you can do this in a trustless way because think about like you know two different layer ones because they have totally different valid like validator set you, you the bridge had to be kind of like multi-sig or some other like validator network where you don't have this kind of shared security but for different layer two if that's your zk based layer two you can read the other chain state through this proof like merkle pass from the other chain and then like but this introduce some latency because you need some time to generate proof and it might break the compatibility bit because, because of this, this latency. And uh, so I do feel like in some sense, it's possible to have some standard in messaging between different layer tools, but it's still not super practical and user express friendly to kind of do that in a fully trusted way. People still use bridge to, to bridge regardless. Um, Another, I, I do feel like you know, as the proving technology has been improved, uh, as as you know, more layer to become adopting some similar standard for how you how this communication can happen, uh, it might be solved. So that's one one, one direction. The other direction, like people keep talking about, is share about share sequencer. So share sequencer is basically like where the same party sequence two sequence like you know like transactions from two different chains. So that's how like that's where you can if you want to interact with the other layer two, and the same sequencer know the order so that's like how you kind of ha can may be possible like you ha have this kind of you know some level of compatibility between different chains but there are like still a lot of problem related to this because most these share sequencer are only ordering the transactions they don't guarantee that like one transaction successfully then like you execute the other it doesn't has that level of atomicity so i like both are still very early I think we are, we are kind of watching closely to the, those those research directions. Um, but currently, it's just focusing on building building one chain. I, I think eventually, different layer two will have different communities, um, and it's good to have some standard to to talk with each other. Um, because it's red, at least compared with different layer one fragmentation, it's radically possible to to do that in a trustless way. Um, but it, it it still takes some time. I mean, when you say different L2s will have different communities, that's kind of at odds with what you said earlier, that kind of different applications will choose different L2s based on um, the security assumptions they need, right? So basically, I may want to play um, some game that doesn't need a lot of security assumptions, but I still want my smart contract wallet living on a different chain, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes, I, I think due to this kind of different... Um, property and assumptions like eventually different layer tools will have different like because they have different value proposition they have totally different mission and vision like some want to kind of you know get users through marketing and that may be part of their brand and some might you know like want to build a totally different new, new community from EVM and uh, um, but we are like you know we, we, we're trying to kind of be people online. But you don't see you don't see like the same users kind of using different chains for different applications right now yes it's because most chains don't have that many like you know exciting applications it's like you know the same suit for for DeFi and like but i do think like you know as you know but but you, you can feel like different chain have totally different brand right like some chance like the first impression is this some some chance first impression this like throws first impression for most people is like super high sam alignment has very rigorous for their tech and, and 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 security assumptions. So if you go to kind of say if you go to the field in Turkey or Malaysia or Nigeria or Argentina, any of the countries you mentioned earlier, well, users who will actually use this to kind of solve real world problems, um, will they care which chain they're on? So I, in my view, kind of 
the, the DAP developer will kind of decide what kind of is the best security or the needed security model for their DAP. And then the user ideally down the line, they won't know which chain it's on, right? They don't they don't have to care about the vibe. It's just like um you and I browse the internet every day and we don't we don't really think about TCP IP. It just happens in the background. Yes, yes, that, that's the most ideal situation. So by developing community there, I'm more saying like you know, doing more like developer education and, and growing like a grassroots developer community because what what's different like in developing community versus developing a global community is there is that like local community can spot a lot of like local problems because if I'm 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 here I don't know if I haven't traveled to those places I don't know like you know what people are building there like what what problem people are facing so like getting developers there and uh, like a track value of line developers there grow community there can help getting more local developer to build applications on top of you and then like potentially get more users so that's also like some so th- 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 that's how you grow this it's not like we are acquiring users and then like user have to choose their chain. But it's more like from application level, we can kind of help more grassroots developer to to build, to solve local problems. And then like users will use them and then use Scroll's default chain. So what does the roadmap look like for Scroll? I, th- I think the very, very kind of short like technical roadmap will be we will use data compression to massively reduce the transaction cost. So like anyone can expect, like, you know, transaction on Scroll will become like, you know, way cheaper, like in, in a few months. And uh, why it takes a few months is because uh, we were trying to minimize the, the frequency for doing upgrade because doing upgrade is very, very kind of scary because you are using multi things to upgrade the most important part of your, your protocol. Um, so being cheap using data compression uh, is a very important part thing we, we will do. And second thing is that we are keep focusing on improving the security. So uh, as you mentioned, like censorship resistance, we are trying to uh, re- like you know have some some solution for that. Um, and this kind of proposal sequencer failure, if if you know we are not producing blocks, then like what will happen? Um, so we are we are working on solutions for that. Uh, that will also like be solved like in in in, in around three months. Like you know after that, a large upgrade will, will happen at that time, and then you will see. Like layer two bit, uh, which is the reference for checking layer two security, like a lot of red uh, area will become green. Um, and also we are exploring how to like even add more security, more than just what layer two bit is talking about. Like people worry about like ZK has bug, ZKM has bug. So like we have exploring like multi uh, multi prover um, system, like where we can add a, another additional prover. So if they keep that to work out, the other prover can still be backup to kind of you know, like make sure like it's secure. So security is very, very important for us. And then like if application care about security, they can come to us. And then that, that will be a like short term goal. And for the research, we are we have been keep focusing on like decentralization. We will have some proposals published to kind of discuss very broadly. Um and uh we we are keep focusing on like working on the next generation Zik EVM to make Zik EVM become ten times faster. There are already some design there, we are still doing benchmark for which proof system we want to use, how to architect the next generation ZK EVM. So it's also there um, as a long-term long term thing. And in terms of ecosystem and community building, I think we will get all the kind of necessary infra, as I mentioned, ready. Like Chainlink just uh, integrated like days ago um, and the units will pass their governance and a lot of like basic building blocks will be there like in, in a few weeks or so like, you know, come and build and then like we will have some like community initiative for the community to 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 interact to to kind of engage um and more calls on, on discord um to kind of uh, like really understand what what our community really need um yeah i i think a lot of initiative will come out and also start community building in the regions we we select and then like double down effort in in kind of helping builders there to build so those are like a, a short term like you know um, yeah, and also like in terms of security, also definitely security console, like which we remove this multi sig to some really credible uh, security console members that they, they will control like upgrade so that we are not controlling like the, the scores like upgrade. So those are things we're, we're happening in short term, like the other, like being cheaper, ultra, ultra like high security, um, and also a lot of community initiative and keep doing research. So that that's for that's what you can expect in the next like three months. And uh, 
I, I I know a lot of projects are coming to to scroll ecosystem. So like follow up like ecosystem account and scroll account and scroll our our main official account will meant for protocol upgrade update. Um, our our members event hexons all those stuff ecosystem. We're talking about ecosystem project. Um, there's weekly like what will happen. So if you know, feel free to kind of uh, interact and then like use what, what like understand what's happening there. And uh, what's the best way to kind of get in touch? Is is there are all the links on your website? The best way should be like our Twitter, where uh, scroll underline ZKP is our official account, and then there's uh, another ecosystem account, uh, which is build with scroll, build on scroll, and need to check. But that's uh, that's like we have another ecosystem account for following the recent ecosystem update. So uh, if you follow that very closely, there is weekly updates around what everything happening on scroll, and uh, we will support multi language community so if you are chinese you are like spanish speaking turkey speaking like it like there will be a like corresponding account like you can follow to to know more about scroll and join our discord definitely yeah perfect thank you so much for joining us today